What's going on, everybody? It's Matt, a.k.a. the Lumberjack Landlord, here with my good buddy, Millennial Mike. Mike, how's it going, my friend? Dude, I'm good. I'm excited to talk about uh, Graham Stephan in this video. <laughs> yes. I wanted you to have, I wanted to have you on this video specifically for one reason, and that was because Mike and Dion were there for the other one. <laughs> Yeah, dude. Those softies, they don't appreciate a good impression when it comes to I life. tell you, I thought I nailed it. I crushed it just a little bit. You know, it was actually pretty good. But yeah. I think what I wanted to do is kind of have you walk me through the process because you weren't there, but you saw it. Mm -hmm. Kind of have you walk me through the process of kind of what that made you think, feel like, the thoughts that it gave you. Because I want to just, let's deep dive into it. I'll share exactly kind of what I was thinking, why sure. I was thinking, what I was thinking. And then, you know, have people better understand exactly the scenario, if you will. Sure. So when I watched your video when you guys were talking about Graham Stephan selling, he actually went on and responded. Graham watched that video and responded yes. to it. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like he must have taken it in not a super negative way because he wasn't angry. He wasn't mad. He just left a comment defending some of his decisions. Uh, when I watched it, I thought it was hilarious. The impression was hilarious. So I watch a lot of like TikTok and Instagram reels. There are entire segments of the Internet solely dedicated to doing impersonations of Gary Vee. And all they do is they take Gary Vee's like, you know, I punted my 20s. I never took a break for like 10 years. And then they they do that at like like a kid's soccer game, you know, and they'll just be like yelling at kids like, hey, you got to work harder and hustle. Like, it's, it's a joke. It's a it's a comedy. Yeah. So yeah. when you did your thing on Graham and some people are like, well, you don't have to be mean to him. Like, dude, it's a joke. You, know, you don't actually want Graham to like fail in business and go bankrupt and have a no. I'm going bankrupt video. It's just it's a joke. It's a joke. That being said, mm -hmm. I do think you have some valid points. If you want to diversify your real estate portfolio, which, OK, fair enough. You did have a video with Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, one of the most famous billionaires there is, sat down with Graham Stephan and said, you're over in real estate. You should diversify more. Whether or not I agree with them, who cares? So if you do want to diversify, is the way to diversify to sell off two properties you own or maybe take those millions of dollars you're bringing in from YouTube and just use some of that? I don't know. Anyways, okay. that was my initial reaction. I'd love to hear more of what you think. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things. I think so, you know, Graham Class Act, right? I, I'm not attacking him at all. <coughs> class Act guy. The advice, it, it, it needs some work. Because again, at the end of the day, for me, no matter how, if I ever got to 4 million subscribers, I would largely not be using my name on investment vehicles that are for, I just think that they're scary. They're just scary to me. I've read a lot of them. I've read a number of the ones with influencers attached to them. They are, they are scary investments as a real estate investor. They are scary to me. So I think that Graham's a, Graham's a stand-up guy. I think, he, I think he was funny in his response. I think there were some interesting points of clarification. One, we don't know what he did with the money from selling his real estate, number one. Because what are you going to do with that money? Where are you then putting that money? Um, I think that's a, that's a big factor. I think often you can take your eye off the ball and you don't have to care about raising your rents on somebody for 10 years when you're making millions of dollars a year on your name and your brand. Right. Self-managing landlords like myself and 98% of the others, that money is a, makes a difference on a monthly basis of that being able to perform and that being able to get our next loan. So I think when I look at that, I look at Graham as I think that he's entertaining. I think that he's funny in a, in a, in a weird sort of way. Um, and I think that he does have some advice that's useful. However, on real estate, I probably, I would not be taking any of his advice because he's selling real estate. He said that, well, I sold it because that's the state that I left behind. Did you leave, did you sell all of your assets in that state that you left behind, which is California, by the way? No, he didn't. Because You didn't. And so you, you sold those, but again, <clears throat> why did you sell them? And again, if you're, if you're being come to for real estate and financial advice and financial guidance, share what you did with those properties, share what you did with them, say, yeah, I sold them. And because of X, Y, or Z, or this is what I then did with the money. I think that's the first part. That was the one, that was the first thing that I had the bone to pick with. So, and I so in, in, in his comment, in his comment that he left on your guys' video, he said, Hey, I sold these two because they were the only two that I owned outright and a cash out refi didn't make sense. That was his, his reason, which to me, 
that doesn't really make sense. Like, it's okay, no well, financial <laughs> sense. Whatsoever. Why would you sell the ones you own outright? How does a cash out refinance not make sense? Like it doesn't make sense at all. You own it outright, you pull some of the money out, reinvest it, keep a cash flow on property. And if he sold them, <laughs> anybody acquiring that asset is either a single family owner that is going to keep that asset and move into it and evict the people anyway, or right. two, they're buying it, but they need to have the return on capital that they need. So their excuse me, their rent is going through the roof anyway. So if the idea was you just don't get to have to play the bad guy or have the difficult conversation with your tenant, that something like that is changing, then I get that. That's what that move accomplishes. If you, mm-hmm. But otherwise, that move doesn't accomplish more financial freedom. It just doesn't, you know? Yeah, I was, I was surprised by that as well. So I, you know, he had mentioned, I think in the original video, he had mentioned Brandon Turner and doing syndication and stuff like that. And if he wants to move into those types of things, I'm not going to tell him he's wrong. I mean, he's significantly more successful than me. That being said, as someone, right. It, as someone who was um, a fan of his back when his channel was just about kind of how to get started real estate investing, which he had experience in how to get started. He had a few rentals to be doing it for a few years. Yep. It's now warped into, and, and there's nothing wrong with it, but he, you know, he's a it's separate, entirely separate YouTube channel where he talks with other millionaires. He gives advice on a whole host of different things. I don't necessarily know if he is really sending the best message to the beginner beginner investors anymore who may still be finding his content, which is a point that you guys made, which was he's going to turn away new people who think, oh, if even Graham Stephan's selling, maybe it's not the right time to get in. Right. Sure. There's that part. The other part too is, is that let's just again, brass tax it, his coffee company. That machine that I saw in the back, it's a multi-thousand dollar machine. I know it's not a $10,000 machine, but it's a multi-thousand dollar machine. He was given it because he started the coffee company. So it cost him nothing. So he's still getting his espressos every day. Again, I'm fine with that. I don't care. But don't talk to me about cutting out my espresso when you bought a $52,000 watch. (laughs) That's that's espresso for life, bro. Like, I don't want to hear that. So- All, what I want the focus to really be is people taking advice where they want to end up in the situation that he might be in. It's not the advice he's giving out now. It's what he was doing when building and going through the process because his coffee brand, I watched the video on his coffee brand. Somebody brought to him the idea, shared with him everything and yep. needed the financial backing. Right. So at that point, you didn't start the company. Mm-hmm. You're now along for the ride. You're now investing in the company. You see what it takes to run a company. Maybe it will be successful. Maybe it won't be. But again, you were given the machine. Right. And you didn't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So it's the age old adage of, you know, those who need don't get and those who want but don't need get. Right. Right. And that's fine. I don't begrudge him that at all. Like, that's cool. We all hope that you get to a bigger, big enough profile someday where, yeah, hopefully I'm getting a call from Lamborghini and then asking me to drive their car, their new car for them. Hmm. I'm all for it. Like, let's go. Let's make sure that this thing is Excel approved, you know? So I think from that perspective, I think, again, I want to be doing and listening to people that are doing deals right now today actively. And that's the most important thing. That's what I love about our community, yourself and Dion and Mike. That's what I love about our community is because we're spending the time doing deals, day, you know, doing deals now actively in this market. And that's where the value comes because an expert that's done a hundred somethings is doing it still right now today. When all you've done is sell some properties because you didn't raise the rent, you owned it outright and you just wanted an exit who is really in that position where they have a couple of paid off properties and a $12 million YouTube channel? Like who's in that position? Yeah. I I think the biggest takeaway that I had from the video was just because you have a very large, a very large YouTube channel on a topic like real estate investing or any topic, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're the most qualified or the the expert in that space. Um, We had this conversation before when we, when Todd Baldwin and Spencer Cornelia did the one rental at a time house hacking thing. And they both talked about how, they don't raise rents on their tenants. Todd said he never even raises rents even when the places go vacant. Um, they both talked about covering several hundred dollar repairs. Like, oh yeah, my garage was hit, cost 200 bucks. I just covered it to make a better relationship with the tenant. Todd had like a $700 dishwasher that he knew was broken by this guy. And he was like, oh, I'm just going to cover it. Like, it's very easy to be generous and to be like that as a landlord. If you have a 
million dollar a year YouTube channel or a, a very, very nice primary income job. But for a lot of folks out there who are just getting started investing or, or maybe even relying on their investments for their income, you yeah. can't cover huge costs and expenses like that. And so my belief is that my generation of millennials, because that's Todd, Graham, Spencer, myself, we're all like 30, 31 years old. People aren't necessarily willing to have those tough conversations. They're like, look, man, you break it, you buy it. You got, I know you don't want the rents getting raised. I myself have actually never raised rent on a tenant because they've moved out every year or two years, but I've raised it every time someone's moved out. Now my property management company, I'm always telling them, yep, let's go ahead and get the increase. Let's get the increase. Um, But if you own a property for 10 years and you do not raise the rent, that is actually negligent behavior on your part as a landlord. If your plan is to ever sell this property, you're going to have to explain to your potential buyer why rents are 10 years undervalued. And when you go to the market and say, well, the rents could be a thousand, but they're only a 500. You know what I say every time I read one of those? Well, why aren't they a thousand if they could be a thousand? I'll believe it when I see it. That's, that's what I see on the pro forma rents. Right. Give me a break with that stuff. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Pro forma mm-hmm. rents. Okay. If that's what you can get for rent. You do it then. Right. You do it. You do it. And then I'll pay that higher price. Mm-hmm. But I think that that really comes into play where they're not having those tough conversations. And I'll take it even a step further. Big surprise. Um, when you have that conversation with your bank, they're looking at your portfolio. Once you get past, like truly, when you get past having five, six, seven, eight buildings, when you get to 10 to 12 to 14, guess what they're looking at? They're looking at your global influence when it comes to rents. Are you raising them? Are you, because they know if you're not having enough money come in, then enough repairs aren't being done on the properties and they fall into disrepair. If there's not enough income on the property, then they're at risk. They want to see the across your portfolio that you have a you know 1.2 percent debt coverage is what they want to see. When you don't raise rents in ten years, you don't have that. And so at the end of the day, when you start and you want, if this is the business that you want to be in and you want to keep on growing it, your bank is going to want to look at that. Now the issue is is that he would then list that with the bank as an asset as this asset's completely paid off and this is what I'm getting for rents. But the bank looks at that and they say, is this going to be a guy that when we give him the loan on the property, he's going to pay it off in two years because he has a ton of other income. Mm-hmm. They don't want to do two year debt to do right. two year loans. They don't want to how do they that. make money. That's not how they make money at all. So you're now no longer aligned with your bank and what their charter is, which is to be part of the community. Do all that work, all that, all that cost and expense sunk into getting that deal done for you. And then they are not servicing it after two years because you paid it off. That is not how to get a bank on your side to show them that you're actually in this business and that you're going to grow it. Right. So again, the only way that you can go 10 years without raising the rent is if money isn't important to you. If or, 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 your business isn't important to you. Or you happen to buy in 2010 at the historically lowest prices California ever saw with extremely low interest rates and had tiny, tiny, tiny little payments. That's the other option. You and, and there's nothing wrong with getting lucky. I love to get lucky. <laughs> at the end of the day, if you happen to time the market perfectly because you turn 19 and 20 at the right time after the recession, then yeah, you, you did get a little lucky. For most people, just the pure increase in property taxes each year is going to force you to increase your rent to keep up with property taxes. And then God forbid you have to repair something on the property. Everyone's prices are going up. So didn't and, mean to cut you off, Matt. Sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. In, in, in California, I think it's, I think it's Prop 13. Um, are you familiar with Prop 13? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like rent control, right? It's fixed price, it's fixed price taxes. So they don't have it like we have it where our taxes go up every year. When they buy a property, they get a tax, and that's what the taxes are for that building moving forward. Oh, well, that's fantastic. That makes it a little easier for them, I guess. It does. The challenge, though, again, the challenge comes into play when he goes to sell that house, either an owner is buying it and that tenant's out anyway, or when that new house is sold, the taxes are now going to be assessed based on that sales price, and that's going to force that person's rent up significantly. But again, the issue becomes, if this is your business... If you want it to operate properly, people like Kevin O'Leary, people like Mark Cuban, they never look at their portfolio and say, this business is performing very well. 
Therefore, I'm not going to do anything with this business over here and raise any of its prices, even though inflation, every business runs in and of itself. Every business has to be self-sustaining. If you want to prepare yourself to be bankable, when you get to a certain size with a real estate portfolio, you must, must, must show them that you have pricing control, that you actually follow the market, that you actually are in line with what the market's doing. They are going to care about that. Very, very, very much. I can tell you, I talk to bankers all the time and we, they still do a review of the properties that I own almost outright or have really small payments on. They still look at what the rents are there because they want to know that you have some flexibility. If that person was at 1500 bucks in rent and you had to raise it to $2,700, what's the likelihood that the place goes vacant and they stop paying for a while? Probably they, extremely likely. So... When you raise it gradually, you make sure that you maintain, have a good tenant, but that you also sow the consistent cash flow. Everything in 10 years has gotten significantly more expensive. Everything. So my advice to people in that, realm, in that part of this is you need to make sure that you're working with your tenants, not saying you have to be above market or even at market, but you need to show a progression that shows that you can have those conversations because banks want to see that too. Yeah, I think that really the takeaway that I'm getting from this is uh, on my point earlier, you know, the difference between somebody who's been doing real estate for, I think Graham's probably coming up on 10 years. He owns like six or seven properties. He hasn't really bought in that many in, in recent years versus somebody who has significantly more experience you and 121 different rental properties. You know, I would never even think about the fact that I need to actually stay attractive to a bank in order for them to continue lending to me. They're going to not want me to pay things off. Just the nuances and the little subtleties that you need to keep in mind that you only get to the point of having that knowledge if you actually have spent real time investing in real estate and not just making silly YouTube videos, which I'm all for, because here we are doing it, which is not as good as he YouTube is videos. making YouTube videos. <laughs> Yeah, I think, like I said, I think Graham is really well-intentioned. I know he's gotten a lot of people to even think about finance that have never thought about finance before ever. For that, it, it's, uh, it's awesome. But when you're looking at real estate, when you're looking at things like that, how successful is his coffee company? You know, I don't know. Is it really super successful? Has it completely taken off? And why did it so? Because I work with a lot of people that start companies from nothing, from zero. Mm -hmm. And they're at best, they have an SBA, a, a small business administration loan. That's the best that they've got. So they're not backing it with hundreds of thousands of dollars of their own cash or millions of dollars, or does the bank know that they have millions of dollars in another bucket? Because I can promise you in working with a bank, it's much, much, much easier for me to borrow money now than it was 10 years ago. I can largely borrow well into the seven figures if I made my case to them now. And then... I was lucky if it was seven figures, including the decimal point then. And so that's the biggest difference is that when you have that money, they're far more likely to underwrite it because you're backing it. So I just want to make sure that people really understand. I think Graham's doing largely. I think he does a service to folks because he gets them to look at finance, but no one ever bought a house because they cut out their latte ever. <laughs> the, best way, the best way to get on the property ladder is to house hack. That's the cheat code to wealth. Right. The 4321 strategy that I've laid out, that is what so many people have, been, have done and been able to do. And that is get rich for sure, not get rich, we think so. Mm -hmm. Over that mm -hmm. amount of time, that is the way to eliminate your highest monthly expense and turn it into an asset instead of a liability. So that's where I think that I think people need to recognize that that's the opportunity. That's the video that needs to be getting in front of impressionable kids because Again, I don't necessarily care what Graham spent his money on, but he does it with a GT, a Ford GT behind him, which is a multi hundred thousand dollar car. Envious admitted, I would love mm -hmm. that. Oh, it's that's gorgeous. A, that's a great car. Yeah. And a watch collection that's well into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying life is a little bit different for Graham than for others. And so you don't have to be on as on top of your game on your individual properties, making sure that you're doing rent increases when quite frankly, he just runs one more ad in a one month period and he's going to dwarf whatever that number was for his part for his rentals. So when you're running rentals as a business, you have to treat it as a business and make sure that you're doing the things that are needed to grow the business, but also 
that you're giving the bank the understanding that you are taking it seriously, you are running this as a business and showing them what you're doing in the market. We show them that we have certain rents that we discount and we show them why we discount them. And they say, we love that. We love that you're giving back to the community. So those are the things that people need to understand and know. And again, I'm very grateful for all the amazing comments that were left. 98% of you took it for exactly what it is. I watch Graham. I think he's funny. I don't watch him all the time anymore, but I think he's funny. And the imitation was only meant to be entertaining and funny for people. Some people took it seriously and thought that I was just being a mean guy. Mm -hmm. Whatever. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. But hopefully, <laughs> I mean, I got a lot more feedback that said people laughed because they thought that I kind of nailed it. And for uh, It is hilarious. For an almost six foot one, 260 pound lumberjack to nail an impression of a five foot seven dude <laughs> with, with a much higher voice. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was funny. So, That's pretty good. Yeah, it was what it was. <laughs> it was what it was. Well, that's pretty much all I wanted to chat about. I wanted to talk a little bit about that video, your response and our actual concerns, but I appreciate you having me on, man. Thank you. I'm happy to do it, Mike. As always, we try and create great content for you guys. Hit the like button, certainly subscribe. Give me your feedback below. Let me know where I missed it. I might've missed it too. I don't know everything, know a lot of things, but I don't know everything. But one thing I do know, 121 rentals, 41 buildings, been doing this for 21 years got a little bit of a track record. I know what I did in my business to grow it and to make sure that my bank could take me seriously. Because when I went to get those bigger and bigger loans, they were willing to work with me and give them to me because they saw how my business ran before I had them. So that's just a little nugget of advice because you're going to want to build the business. And the easiest way to do that is through relationships with your bank, where they understand that you are a, not just an investor, that you are a great operator. And that is a difference maker. Mike, any other things from you, my friend? I mean, I think we pretty much covered everything. Just thanks for having me on. I'm happy to do it, my friend. Check Mike out, Millennial Mike on YouTube. Awesome, fun videos. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you again, Mike. Thanks for the time. See you.